the emotional centers of the brain. The dominant brainwave of that limbic system is theta. Mm -hmm. So if you're not in a type of therapy that's talking the language of that part of the brain, you're missing it, right? Wow. It's like you're strengthening the rational adult who can tell you things about the trauma. That's what talk therapy mm -hmm. does, right? It's like, okay, I can learn how to normalize it. I can learn how to be aware of it. I can be mindful of it. But you wanna go straight to the part of the brain where the trauma is stored. Mm -hmm. So internal family systems, EMDR, hypnosis, ketamine, to really heal that part of the brain. Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Dow, New York Times bestselling author of The Ketamine Breakthrough. Today on Ever Forward Radio, I'm gonna be talking about the new book, Ketamine Assisted Psychotherapy, how it can help you heal your brain and maybe change your life. Hey, welcome back everybody to Ever Forward Radio. I'm your host, Chase Tuning, and today we are diving deeper into a philosophy, a concept, a modality of wellness that I have really embraced over the last several years. The whole nice. concept of, you know, the bio psychosocial model is yeah. something that it's when you actually just hear those words, mm. it just makes the most sense to me. Yep. We're talking about what is going on internally in our internal ecosystem, what we're doing with the external self, yeah. but then also this kind of like elusive third variable of consciousness and mm. you know, the psyche. It's how do we think about it? How do we feel about it? But then how do we think and feel about our thinkings and feelings? Right. And then how do we you know, <laughs> apply them and maintain all of that? Yeah. Uh, it's incredible. I, I think that is just like, that's what I'm after the most. Mm. And it's so cool in pursuit, you know, not me exclusive, anybody, when you're in pursuit of making your life better mm -hmm. to then find scientific proof that, oh, like this is a thing. It yeah. kind of like validates this internal knowing and ways we're finding success on our own yeah. to the human experience. Yeah, and I love what you just said about primary and secondary emotions and like what you tell yourself about the thoughts and feelings. <laughs> and then how, you know, let's say you take these really yeah. expensive pre and probiotics, mm -hmm. uh, but then what you're telling yourself about your thoughts and feelings actually is killing these very expensive probiotics. We've seen that in research, right? So it's like, unless you get the mind right, even some of these other things are going to be ineffective or less effective mm -hmm. because you're, you know, just one one of many, many examples. It's like you're killing the good gut bacteria that you're spending all this money on if you don't have your mind right. Yeah. You're, you're killing your own, poten own potential um, before you even really give it a, a fighting chance in yeah. a lot of ways. Um, how have you changed over the years as a therapist, because mm. you're someone committed to the work, the biopsychosocial yep. approach. Yep. Um, you're also committed to continuous education for personal and professional reasons you have to. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm sure, you know, as a professional, we all kind of, if we're in the same profession for a decade, mm. like you have been, and plus, you probably evolved and changed along the way. So like, how have you as a therapist changed personally, but also then how have you like, improved and apply that in your practice? That's a great question. So I started my career, um, when I finished my master's and doctorate, I was working for a department of mental health agency. And it was very old school, mm -hmm. sort of 80s, 90s model. And what I mean by that, and I talk about this in the ketamine breakthrough, you know, back in the 60s, you know, sort of these New York cycle analytically trained therapist mm. days. Maybe you see in like Woody Allen movies and people are in psychoanalysis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There was this wave of therapy that was very depth oriented, right? And the subconscious was really important. Back in the day, the treatment du jour today, people are talking about EMDR, which mm -hmm. I like, and I use some bilateral stimulation reprocessing. But, you know, back in the day, hypnosis was mm -hmm. what the VA was using to treat PTSD. And by the way, clinical hypnosis that I'm training is also quite effective for reprocessing trauma. Yeah, we but, actually just had a funny timing by the time this is live we just had an episode with uh sam visnick or coming out soon yeah cracking open an incredible new world of of science and science and application with hypnotherapy yeah um, like it's again very real science it very, is very real it's very real and i think this transition you know in the 80s and and 70s when cognitive behavioral therapy became mm -hmm. this quote gold standard um i think it sort of moved away from the depth and the and the and the, the subconscious and, you know, so going back to how I've changed. So I was working for this Department of Mental Health Agency and they wanted to see me do um, 
intakes and, um, you know, Medicare, Medi-Cal approved assessments. And mm -hmm. they wanted to see me working with somebody. And I'm going to, in my work, reduce self-mutilating behaviors from four times per week to two times per week, mm -hmm. right? So it's all about the symptom, the mm -hmm. symptom, the symptom. What is What are you seeing on the surface? How can these cognitive behavioral strategies help with that, right? It's almost, uh, it's like the things you see on the surface. So I often compare that to sort of allopathic Western medicine, which right. has a yeah. place and is yeah. great. You know, obviously uh, our, our significant yeah. others, it, there's a place for that. Mm -hmm. You know, certain models of Western medicine are great worst case scenario medicine. Acute care, uh, acute emergency care. care. Absolutely. You yeah. know, my husband's an ER doctor. Mm -hmm. Like you do not want to go anywhere else when you're in that worst case scenario. <laughs> right, you yeah. better be with a great ER doctor to help you not die, mm -hmm. right? Um, but sort of going back, I really consider the biopsychosocial and now with ketamine spiritual approach, mm. uh, the equivalent of root cause oriented functional medicine, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. you want to go down to the symptom. So it's not just what you see on the surface. So I think early in my career, I was very sort of surface oriented and symptom directed because well, that's, that's how I had to be. How you were trained. And yeah, that was the standard at that time. That's yep. actually how you were expected and probably told to perform your job. Yes. And then... As I was sort of working with patients, I realized, okay, this is working for some people, but mm -hmm. there's like this whole other subset, not even a subset, like 50 to 60% of the people that this is not enough. This is not getting to the core of the problem. So then I get trained in all these other forms of therapy, uh, like clinical hypnosis, trauma reprocessing, and then, you know, the, the magic Mm -hmm. aha moment, ketamine assisted mm -hmm. psychotherapy, which we'll get there. Soon. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. So, so now I am just so much more, I am, I consider the depth oriented approaches, Jungian approaches, internal family systems, parts work, and man, and then you combine those depth oriented approaches with ketamine. Mm. And now I'm seeing people, it's like, now it's a whole enchilada. Now yeah, it's yeah. like the symptoms on like, the this surface are changing. This is what I've been changing. waiting for. Yes. This is what I've been working for. Yes. Yeah. But also like the why, mm. you know, so when CBT first came out, you know, which was sort of this marriage of the cognitive therapy and the behavioral therapy, and they put them together. Now it's sort of like this umbrella mm -hmm. um, for medical conditions, psychological conditions, right? Like if, if you have overactive bladder and you wanna like help reduce caffeine intake, that's like a cognitive behavioral mm -hmm. strategy. It's like these simple lifestyle tips, but it doesn't go to like the heart of the matter. So I think when you can unpack that, then you really change lives, which mm -hmm. is exciting. I mean, that's, I feel like no matter what we're talking about in the human experience, the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual aspect, whatever yeah. form of wellness we're working on or just what we want for our lives in mm. terms of advancement, meaning, purpose. Um, that's like it. It's just, here's what's being presented in my life, physically, yeah. mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Yeah, There's something always at the bottom that is the driving force behind it. And it's, we kind of just have all of these tools, right? Yeah. To chip away, to make it less or to make it more depending on what we need or want. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we're actually addressing or getting to the thing. Yeah. So why is it so difficult for us to get to the thing, whether that's personally or finding the right professional, maybe through therapy, like why, why can't we just fast track and go, let's get to the root. Here's the root. Let's uproot the thing or yep. at least learn how to coexist with it. I think we have so many defenses, right? And, and sometimes traumas are buried in the subconscious and people have trouble even accessing them, right? They mm -hmm. have a lot of dissociation or repression or denial or projection, right? All those sort of classic yeah. Freudian defense mechanisms. Like sometimes we're, we're literally not aware of traumas that have been imprinted. Yes. Like they're I mean, that extreme yes. survival mode has kicked in and it's just like shut off. And it's a different part of you. Mm. So I have people who have survived childhood trauma and it's like the part of them that stores the memory doesn't even have words. And sometimes mm. I will see when I'm working with them, they will revert back to a, an eight year old state where I oh, can wow. see like, you know, dissociative identity disorder, wow. formerly known as multiple personality disorder, we all have a version of that, right? It's like, it's just more extreme in, in DID where people sort of have these very wow. siloed parts of themselves, but we all have these parts of ourselves. So when, we, when I do inner child work, which to me is really correlated with the amygdala, which is the brain smoke detector. If your amygdala, because of something that happened to you in childhood sexual abuse when you were eight, or as a veteran when you were 22 and something in that amygdala got turned up, 
if we're talking about what's going on in your everyday life, mm -hmm. yeah, we're seeing the symptoms, we're seeing hypervigilance, but unless you go to that root and you turn down the smoke detector by going to that inner child, by going and reprocessing that memory, we're never actually getting to the root cause, which is even though why veterans with PTSD, the most common medication they're gonna be prescribed is an SSRI antidepressant, as soon as you stop taking it, the symptoms mm -hmm. come right back mm -hmm. because it's helping with the symptoms, but it's not going to the core and also the parts of the brain where trauma is stored. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really important for people to understand. Well, also not to disregard when symptoms are so severe, we need or even want something to suppress them or alleviate them or yeah. you know, mitigate them. Um, when, in your professional opinion, I know this is probably a, a blanket statement here, yeah. No, but an example being, this is when maybe something like that, let's say a medication, would be the smartest choice right now, mm. but mindful of that we don't want this to be a Band-Aid. So like basically a stepping stone to the next work, right? I think there are a lot of people in that situation, and I think that's okay. So when you're going to do this work, the myth about therapy is that therapy should always be easy and comfortable and warm and fuzzy and your therapist is just going to like hold that, your right? hand, right? It's like too much warm and fuzzy clips going around. I, I, mean, I don't like that. You know, I, I think, yes, obviously you want to have a good relationship. You want to feel that your therapist mm -hmm. cares about you. But if your therapist is just talking to you and just being supportive of you and using these very humanistic approaches, which have a time mm -hmm. and a place, it's, it's not going to allow you to go to those deep places. So yes, you should mm -hmm. be in a time and a space where you're feeling like, okay, I have the time to start to unpack this. So if I have a new project at work and my mom is um, going through a health crisis and I'm taking care of her, maybe right now is not the time, maybe three months is the time. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see maybe for that person going on an SSRI or a benzodiazepine, maybe that mm -hmm. is a good choice for them until they have the time and the emotional space okay. to really open up those wounds or open Pandora's box. Because sometimes mm -hmm. it, people do get a little bit, they don't get worse, but they are going to be consciously aware of things that they've been repressing. They're gonna open up Pandora's box and things are gonna come out of that box and sometimes they are going to be uncomfortable. I yeah. have a lot of people tell me um, I often pretty quickly when I work in these deep ways, I will often sort of, if a primary care physician who's doing your physical is looking for that knee tap, <laughs> knee jerk reaction, I'm going down and I'm going down and I'm looking for the tears. I'm looking for like that. I'm looking for the pain. That's right? the mental health knee jerk reaction. It That's, is. Wow. Amazing so analogy. When, I don't like Right. seeing people cry, but oftentimes I know that I'm in the right space because now we're not that's talking about- That's how you know you're about, on track in, yeah. in, in helping them. And not the part of the ego that's trying to repress that or take mm -hmm. care of that pain, but the pain itself, right? Mm -hmm. The shame, the sadness, because that's the right spot, neurologically mm -hmm. speaking, that's how we actually process trauma. It's like we have this, sometimes therapy, it's like this adult brain uh, is, is mitigating or managing or, you know, not allowing the pain to come forth. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can go down and, you know, ketamine is a facilitator for mm -hmm. people who can't do that in, in ordinary talk therapy, it's, it's just a really fantastic facilitator. And then you have those breakthroughs, right? Cause then yeah, you start yeah. from like the very, very inside out. It's yeah. like functional medicine. If you're, if you've got a thyroid condition and you want to go down and then, you know, your TSH is, mm -hmm. uh, over, you know, Ideally, hopefully that's under two, maybe it's over four or six. Um, and instead of just throwing out a thyroid medication, maybe you want to see like, well, what, what's going on? Like, why do you have that mm -hmm. autoimmunity? It's sort of the same thing. And, you know, so a functional medicine doc is going to look at your intestinal permeability and what mm -hmm. foods are you reacting to? And, you know, why is there inflammation? It's, it's a very similar model. So I always kind of think mm -hmm. of that as like a parallel. Um, one area that's been fascinating me recently in personal research and also a lot of the guests we've had on the show, um, especially recently, Dr. Chris Palmer, this MD psychiatrist from Harvard, uh, mm. wrote this amazing book recently called The Brain, uh, brain Energy, The mm. Brain Energy Theory, um, is really kind of making a pretty bold claim, but one that I can get on board with, and that's all root cause to mental illness is, um, or I should say, excuse me, the root cause of all mental illness is actually poor metabolic health. Mm. So basically, there is a root cause underlying all mental illness that if we can address or get ahead of can 
prevent mm. or radically be allevi- alleviated or like made better. Yeah. What's your stance on that? Is, it, do you agree that at the root cause of mental health problems, mental illness is, you know, the physical self? Because you were talking a lot about, you know, functional medicine and gut yeah. permeability. I believe that when we focus on the body, we can help the mind and vice versa. But yep. uh, has that kind of come up in your work? Yeah, I would say that the root cause are these metabolic disorders mm-hmm. or trauma, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's sort of half and half. So for some people, the root cause is the trauma itself. But we're also seeing in research that a, a subset, and again, it's not a small subset, a, a large subset of people who don't respond to traditional antidepressants, mm. it's because they have an inflammatory disorder, right? So uh, then you're looking at labs uh, like if your HSCRP that a cardiologist is looking at to determine your risk for heart attack mm-hmm. or cardiovascular events, if that's over one, those people have a higher likelihood of having an inflammatory depression. Mm. People who have an elevated A1C are going to have uh, a higher risk of both depression and dementia because those blood sugar spikes are shrinking your hippocampus rapidly. Wow. And that's just not affected, uh, linked to, to memory because you know most people think hippocampus mm-hmm. memory, but when that shrinks, we also see more depression. So yes, I think there are both these biological drivers of depression, anxiety, mm-hmm. OCD. Um, I don't even really care about the diagnosis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's because the diagnosis, wow. the ICD code, if we code somebody for an anxiety disorder, mm-hmm. it doesn't tell us anything of about why, mm-hmm. right? It can be mm-hmm. biological, it can be trauma related, and you've got to really, you know, the reason that I look at labs is because I want to, and you know, also this this genetic testing and looking at, you know, APOE4 or MTHFR or your markers and genes that will make you more prone to inflammation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's fascinating because then you can start to see and help to explain to people, Mm -hmm. this is why, right? Mm -hmm. So for some people, especially if they have an inflammatory depression, those people are gonna respond to high dose omega-3s because that's gonna bring down that inflammation. By the way, ketamine also reduces inflammatory cytokines, so it's it's a great root cause medicine. But I think, again, going to that root level is just vital. You and I were speaking um, before the podcast a couple weeks ago, and I was kinda, we were kinda like sharing some like life hacks, biohacks, all this stuff we're kind of diving yeah, into. Yeah. And um, what you're talking about struck a chord with me because it, I was just like, I've had this happen. Mm. I th- I was having this, I thought mental health flare up mm. of depression. That's just unexplicable depression that would mm-hmm. kind of pop up every so often. And I, I literally had May, um, it got to a point where I was like, baby, like, treat me like a patient, mm-hmm. run me through this questionnaire. Mm-hmm. And she said at the end, like, I would actually recommend, I would, I, if you were my patient, I would say, I would probably recommend you for either regular therapy around this, or honestly, like you might want to consider medication. Mm. And I was like, this just doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, fast forward, I got this functional medicine test, Yep. found out that my body just burns through dopamine. Mm. Whenever I have like a high high or like yep. a success in life or work, or like even just, I noticed, significant time around family and friends. Like whenever, whenever I'm in yeah. life and enjoyment, yeah. dopamine high, yeah. my body just drops it. Right. I burn through it and it takes me longer to replenish it. That was the depression I was experiencing. Right. And here I am thinking that I've got this new mental health problem or yeah. like a flare up yeah. when actually it's something going on internally. It's so interesting when you do genetic testing on people and you can see this COMT gene that also, uh, that either makes you uh, a slow or in your case, a fast mm-hmm, processor. Mm-hmm. And by the way, that gene also has uh, other implications in other areas of health. Uh, it's just so fascinating. And it's not just one gene. It's fascinating to me how I'm a sensation seeker because I have some mm. some uh, mutations in my dopamine genes, right? So, so I it's actually, not just a personality trait. It's like who I am. Who yeah, you, are. yeah wow. it, you can see that wow. on people's genetic reports. And, you know, I think you and I are probably just, you know, sensing your personality mm. type in mind. We probably love the way dopamine feels, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And if you have these mutations in your dopamine genes, it's like you've you have less receptors, mm. so you need a little bit more dopamine than the average person to feel normal. So you're actually more likely to be diagnosed with addiction, but less likely mm. to be diagnosed with, um, and also probably more likely uh, for depression, but less likely to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder or phobia, right? Because certain people who don't like the way excess dopamine feels, those are the sensation avoiders. Mm. 
they will have a lot of anxiety. So you can kind of see that every gene sort of has, it's you're pulling on all these different levers and, and pulleys that can really affect yeah. what you do, what you gravitate towards, and also the treatment that works mm -hmm. from foods to mm -hmm. supplements to which medication or which, yeah. uh, which uh, psychedelic medicine yeah. you're, you're, you're gonna wanna take. For me, it was just like, even just the knowing can be mm. medicine. Yeah. For me, just finding out that there's nothing wrong with me because I was just, like I, I do all the things, I, I take care of my mind, my body, yeah. I'm hydrating, sleeping. Like I was just so, like, how could this be? Yeah. And I, I was really getting into a lot of negative self-talk mm. and it was even then spilling over into my work. I, I would just go in my office and just sit on the floor, stare at the wall. I was so unmotivated to do the things that I always love to do. Yeah. And it, just, it really, it, it messed with me. But then literally just knowing, just finding out that I, it really doesn't matter because mm. like, this is just who I am. And I just need to give myself a little time and a little grace Yep. in, in a day, maybe two, I'm going to be back to normal. Yep. And so, okay, I don't need to resist this. Yeah. I just need to let my body do its thing. What you just said, I mean, that's the knee jerk reaction. Mm. Something's wrong with me. Right. And mm -hmm. your inner critic is saying something's wrong with me. Something's wrong with me. So then because you don't have the information, you're looking at those states and you're saying something is wrong with me. And then mm. you're you're charging the brain with a lot of bias. And now you're looking at your whole life mm -hmm. and yourself, criticizing yourself more, the inner critic gets even louder. Mm -hmm. And then everything you do feels worse when really it can allow you to be mm -hmm. mindful. I've had people who've done mindfulness trainings and for some people, they say it makes them worse because it's like, really? it, listen, but I love mindful too techniques. Much. It's, it's almost like because they didn't have that answer, Mindfulness uh -huh. is just telling you, well, just tolerate it. Just mm -hmm. watch it, don't judge it. But some people are like, but there's something here. Like I wanna know what's here. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I, yeah. somebody new I started yeah. working with this was in this boat and um, you know, this person did all of the mindfulness-based therapies that are wonderful, mm -hmm. but this person also wanted to know what you had, which is the, the why. Mm -hmm. And once you know the why, I think then you can use the mindfulness mm -hmm. techniques. Uh, the mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, these mm -hmm. mindfulness-based therapies that do work to tolerate that as long as you know what it is, right? <laughs> so that's interesting too. Sometimes, you know, ignorance is bliss, I still mm -hmm. feel like, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of power and a lot of health to be had in the knowing, yeah. like you've been talking about. Um, I want to now shift gears a little bit into specific um, diagnoses, specific things that people suffer, mm -hmm. something that I have suffered with for, for many years and have actually, you know, through forms of therapy and through ketamine therapy mm -hmm. have been transformed. Um, and that's PTSD. Mm. And diving into your work, I was, I was finding so many amazing things about post-traumatic stress disorder yeah. that I was like, oh, like I, I, I can feel this, I can understand it, yep. but also it helped me understand things in a totally different way that yep. I didn't know people you know, would be experiencing through PTSD because I only know my experience. Yeah. Primarily, a group of people can go through the same traumatic event. Yep. The same horrible thing can happen to them, around them, the same time, same day, all this stuff. But for some reason, reasons that you'll explain, it imprints deeper, harder, more traumatic on some than others. Yeah. And some really fascinating things around that, such as um, susceptibility or even levels of oxytocin, mm -hmm. quality of sleep, and a lot mm -hmm. of different you know biomarkers that we can be looking at. Um, why is that? And secondly, does that mean by better taking care of our bodies, we can become more resilient to traumatic events? The short answer to that question number two is yes, absolutely. But then let's go to question number one. So we know that people who have lower levels of oxytocin, which I can also see in the genetic report that I do for people. So if you have those mutations in the gene that is coding for your oxytocin levels, you may be more likely than somebody in your um, pl platoon. Is that the right word? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> platoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to be, if you all go through the same My trauma, military unit, yeah. Yeah, uh, you're going to be diagnosed and experience mm. PTSD because of your low levels of oxytocin. We see this in research. People who go through a traumatic event, mm. a, a traumatic event, and are administered intranasal 
oxytocin immediately after the, the event are much less likely to go on and be diagnosed with PTSD. No so that's really interesting. I like, think we within, should have what, that as a treatment. What time people. frame is that? Like uh, immediately, you know, so usually within the first 24 to 48 hours, okay. I believe in the research. So this is kind of like a trauma first response, first aid kit. Yeah. Wow. So I think people who go into the military, you know, first of all, I think we should have intranasal oxytocin available if you're in a high traumatic wow. uh, event likelihood scenario, like uh, I'd the military, keep that on my person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, I also think that if you have this genetic testing, maybe you want to sort people out, right? Mm. So I don't think uh, people with one or two copies of APOE4, which is the gene that is sometimes called the dementia gene or the Alzheimer's gene, you probably don't want to play professional football mm. with that gene. So maybe you should just know that because with a Meaning head injury you get and a couple APOE4, TBIs, you're exacerbating oh, the situation. Yeah, now, yeah, because you're with two copies of APOE4, your lifetime risk of dementia is already around 50-50. Mm. And then you add head injuries and multiple head injuries to that, that's that's a recipe for disaster. Wasn't this the one that uh, came up recently with Chris Hemsworth? Yes. Okay, yes. yeah. So yeah, yeah. he has, I believe, I a believe APO4. he has two copies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you have one copy, um, but it's not a it's not a sentence, right? But right, you do right. want to mitigate your mm -hmm. your lifestyle as best you can. Right. And for trauma, maybe you want to look at that oxytocin gene. And maybe if you're 18 and you're deciding to go into the military or not, maybe you want to know if you have that gene. Mm. Um, also sleep. So, you know, I, I know you and I are sort of biohackers and the Team aura sleep. ring. <laughs> Over here, yeah. <laughs> that we both sort of yeah. wear these, these devices. If you're the kind of person who doesn't get a lot of REM sleep, you probably are also because, you know, the REM cycle, uh, you know, the deep sleep that occurs mostly in the first few hours after you fall asleep is great for physically restoring the body. Mm -hmm. But the REM sleep cycle. That's when like HGH is being produced and yep. all these restorative elements for recovery. Really. Yep. And it's deeper. It's delta mm -hmm. wave, which is the lowest band of, of waves we would see on an EEG. And then your brain goes up into theta, which is when you dream. And isn't it so interesting that when you dream, you have this rapid eye movement, right? Mm. You're in this theta brainwave. When you are in a therapy called EMDR, mm. eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing, you know what they do? Eye movement, they, they do this, right? So you can do it with your finger, and I'm doing this. It's like REM on demand. REM on demand. Wow. Clinical hypnosis. What happens when you hypnotize people? Uh, yeah, yeah. Have you yeah, ever yeah. seen somebody, when I hypnotize patients, sometimes I'll do this like eye flutter thing. It's really trippy. Huh. It's when you, you do it. Yeah, well, when I've been hypnotized, okay, I, gotcha. I have a lot of eye flutter. And when I do it to patients, when I hypnotize patients, you'll see them and their eyes start to like flutter. And like sometimes they almost look like their eyes are rolling back but they're in the theta brainwave. So that's, so that, a, that's a signal that they're in theta. Correct. Mm. Interestingly, guess what else takes you down in like the theta delta area? Ketamine. So isn't it so interesting that all of mm. these, so the natural way, mm -hmm. the organic way that the body knows to emotionally process is the theta brainwave that you are in when you get sufficient REM sleep. Wow. So if you're the kind of person, I get a lot of REM sleep. Mm -hmm. My husband does not. He gets way more deep sleep than I do naturally. Mm -hmm. I do not. If I don't fast three hours before bedtime, I get mm -hmm. like 15 minutes of deep sleep. Mm -hmm. But I get great REM sleep. So I'm a little bit more emotionally resilient, but sometimes I'm more physically tired because of just the way my body likes to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I've got to sort of change that. But it's fascinating, right? Because now we're looking at all the therapies that really work. These, uh, these psychedelic medicines, especially ketamine, uh, the trauma reprocessing that is sort of uh, imitating REM sleep in a way, mm. clinical hypnosis, these theta brainwave states, they're far more effective. Mm. And they're sort of these closed eye therapies. So it's like you're talking to a different part of the brain. Yeah. In traditional yeah, yeah, talk yeah. therapy, when people think of quote psychotherapy, yeah. they think I'm gonna be talking and my therapist is gonna be responding, asking me questions. And in the old, terrible model of processing <laughs> trauma, the cognitive behavioral therapy-based yeah. trauma is have a veteran come in for 50 sessions, have him tell you the trauma from beginning to yeah. end over and over and over again. And you can slowly chip away because mm -hmm. the brain will eventually associate a feeling of safety right. and that event, but it takes a long time. You're and like, guess and what? You're the, kind of like desensitizing yourself a little correct. bit to that traumatic experience. But yeah. guess what? the dropout rate is very high because who wants to go to 50 
therapy session and, relive and recount that. it again yeah, yeah. and again and again. So you can fast forward that with ketamine assisted psychotherapy, with some of these other novel mm -hmm. trauma reprocessing methods, but you've got to get into the theta brainwave and the limbic system, the mm -hmm. amygdala, the emotional centers of the brain. The dominant brainwave of that limbic system is theta. Mm -hmm. So if you're not in a type of therapy that's talking the language of that part of the brain, you're missing it, right? Wow. It's like you're strengthening the rational adult who can tell you things about the trauma. That's what talk therapy mm -hmm. does, right? It's like, okay, I can learn how to normalize it. I can learn how to be aware of it. I can be mindful of it. But you wanna go straight to the part of the brain where the trauma is stored. Mm -hmm. So internal family systems, EMDR, hypnosis, ketamine, to really heal that part of the brain. All of that was amazing, but one of the most fascinating things I'm taking away is that there's external oxytocin. <laughs> there's like that's a that's a new bio. That's a yeah. oxytocin could be a supplement. Yeah. Um, or also, it kind of reminds me of fundamentally, I believe, meaningful quality relationships is one of the best health hacks, biohacks ever. One thousand percent. In that, why odds are we're probably touching, hugging. That's right. So much more releasing right. oxytocin. Again, it, this isn't just like out there woo woo stuff. And what does it mean? Relationships health help my health. Well, it's quality, meaningful, consistent touch that naturally releases this. So I, I also am thinking like, <laughs> if the military could get to, maybe not every soldier, every person gets uh, oxytocin nasal spray. Yeah. Maybe before every training, every deployment, you just hug. Hug. Every, maybe like that's, you know, the next the part of drilling dog. ceremony. Yeah, yeah, no, you get something like kind of that cuddle. emotional support. It, wow. There are so many ways to release oxytocin. And, you know, human beings, we have more, which is why we also, speaking of relationships, have the ability to be in long-term monogamous relationships. You know, we share these higher levels of oxytocin with right, the mammals yeah. that are in long-term monogamous relationships. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think a lot of the biohackers are missing. You know, they're taking resveratrol and NMN and they're, you know, some of the things that you and I like to talk about it, <laughs> you know, mTOR and AMPK and all the things. Not that hating, and also life. not excluding ourselves sometimes. Yeah. But in all the research, you know, if you don't have those strong mm -hmm. networks and relationships, yeah. uh, your lifespan, your ability or your chances of surviving mm -hmm. a heart attack go way down. But if you have those relationships, mm -hmm your lifespan will go up. So it's, you know, again, it's it's taking the supplements, it's mm -hmm. knowing the biology, mm -hmm. but the psychology, the social mm -hmm. aspect is just as important as all those hacks. I don't know why, but this, uh, this anal or this uh, picture comes to mind of a colander. Mm. And I feel like, you know, if we go with, we are the colander, right? We are, mm. you know, the drainer that we dump our spaghetti in, let mm -hmm. the water out. That is us and all the things we're typically doing. I think a lot of us, gravitate towards in terms of better well-being. Yeah. Some of that stuff's going to stay in, but a good amount now or over time is yep. going to trickle out. When we focus on I think this missing link, the secret sauce of mental health, yeah. of meaningful connection, like yeah. we're slowly patching every individual hole and then everything we're doing is pouring in and filling that cup and staying in there. Mm. And we need to, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to realize what should go on our colander mm -hmm. um, and, and what needs to be drained out and, you know, how yeah, do we fill true, our bucket true. and our yeah. energy reserves and, uh, you know, how full is your cup and mm -hmm. all these, these metaphors of, do you have people in your life who fill up your cup or take from it, mm -hmm. you know? And can you just fill Keep making holes bigger more? for some damn reason, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, going to the core, I had this, I was working with somebody and Sometimes when you have this breakthrough and you sob and you realize that what you are doing is not meaningful and that aha moment that feels painful can change your life, what a gift, you know? Mm -hmm. I will often use the deathbed question and I, you know, I help people to reframe. It's like, okay, you're 99, you're on your deathbed. What are you thinking? Is this something that you would be worried about mm -hmm. or not, right? And usually it's like, oh, the thing that I'm worried about, it's mm. it's a blip. Like what really matters? What do you want to be doing? If you had unlimited money and you could do anything, what would you be doing? And mm. then, you know, figure out a way how to do that either for your main nine to five or like your side hustle. Yeah. Uh, but purpose and meaning, that's what makes us want to live. So if we can all extend our lifespan by 30%, but we're all ego driven and we are materialistic and we are um, sort of in this state of self-referral, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. object referral, mm -hmm. uh, 
is what Deepak Chopra calls it, um, or in the ketamine work, you know, you're in that sort of inner critic, um, the party that wants to compare your car to other people's car, their your bank account, and all of these things. And the beautiful thing about ketamine work is that who you are, your bank account, your title, that's all gone mm -hmm, in these deep mm -hmm. ketamine states. And you realize, oh, everything is just a construct, yeah. you know? So what do I nothing identify matters. with? <laughs> Literally nothing matters. <laughs> nothing <laughs> matters. And then sometimes because nothing matters, paradoxically, mm -hmm. then the things that really should matter start to matter, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it's like you can be a, a speck of dust and you realize, you know, the analogy I often use, it's like, You've been on Earth, but for the first time you're an astronaut, and then you can see the Earth from the moon, mm -hmm. and it's like, Phew! the first time, where did I read this? Uh, I feel like this is from a psychedelic uh, researcher. It sounds the, about right. <laughs> the first time, was it in the 60s, that most human beings on Earth got to see a photo mm -hmm. of the Earth from the moon? Phew! The this pale huge blue dot, shift, right? right? Yeah. But that's what ketamine does. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, this is also inconsequential and I have an important part to play, but I'm so connected to yeah. other living beings. Which is perfect timing. Let's kind of now shift into what you've been talking about. And I know it's at the core of your new book and something that I personally have gone through about 13, maybe 15 times mm -hmm. now over the last year and a half. Yep. Ketamine therapy, ketamine yes. assisted psychotherapy. Yes. To kind of piggyback off of our last section on PTSD, that's why I went in. I yeah. went in to seek ketamine assisted psychotherapy to really face in a big, big way my PTSD around yeah. the death of my father. Yes. And I'm sure we'll highlight some of the sections of my experience. You know, feel free to use me as a sounding board or questions there. Yeah. But I've talked about it a lot on the show. Um, but I would love to kind of define our terms ketamine therapy. Like, what is it? Is it safe? Why is this, you know, you've talked about it so much. Why is this so important and so revolutionary for therapy work now? Oh, so many reasons. So let's start with the biochemical, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at SSRIs, um, you know, it's sort of like a Band-Aid. And mm -hmm. if you look at ketamine as a functional approach, these are all the things that ketamine does. Number one, it boosts all your neurotransmitters. So it's boosting dopamine, like Wellbutrin does, an mm -hmm. antidepressant. It's also boosting serotonin, like SSRIs do. It's also boosting uh, feel-good chemicals like GABA that benzodiazepines do all in one medicine, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like you've got the best of modern psychiatry, uh, but in a way that's not doing it in an artificial way. So it's not trying to, like a, a, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it's not trying to sort of, quote, artificially block the reuptake. It's actually working on this really abundant neurotransmitter glutamate. Mm. And by targeting the glutamate system, you get these downstream effects, which is probably why we see these improvements in the more traditional neurotransmitters. Mm. And a lot of researchers in the past 10 to 20 years are realizing that, hmm, interesting, maybe the glutamate system is more central to mood disorders than the serotonin system. So uh -huh. maybe we're in the wrong spot Barking the whole the time. Wrong tree, yeah. But then also, you know, again, going back to these functional approaches and, you know, your COMT mutation, for people with an inflammatory depression, you know, so if you have an elevated HSCRP, if you're eating the Western diet at all, <laughs> or you have a genetic susceptibility for more inflammation, or you have some sort of um, infection, right? Mm -hmm. I use uh, ketamine assisted therapy with a lot of uh, people with chronic Lyme, chronic fatigue, some of these really hard to treat illnesses or syndromes and, and a lot of uh, uh, addictions, right? You know, substance abuse, alcoholism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, so then it's also targeting inflammation. There's a reduction in those pro-inflammatory cytokines that we see in everything from long COVID to Lyme disease mm -hmm. to, you know, any, any infection under the sun. It's also like all psychedelics, including the quote classical psychedelics. So interestingly, ketamine is not a classical psychedelic. The classical psychedelics are also targeting the serotonin receptor mm. versus ketamine that is targeting that glutamate receptor. Um, but whether it's the classical LSD, psilocybin, or this atypical um, novel psychedelic ketamine, uh, they're all helping to increase connectivity in mm. the brain. Um, this is uh, the term neural crosstalk, correct? Neural crosstalk, neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's... 
there's sort of a crosstalk of these parts of the brain that usually don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. They're now talking to each other. And then that brings me to another point, which is the default mode network. So before the age of five, we're all tripping all the time because <laughs> the default mode network has not. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> which is why, you know, the Buddhists call it the yeah. uncarved block. We come into this world and when you see like a, a six month old, like discovering their or playing with their feet, it's like yeah. they're, they're kind of tripping, right? It's like they don't have a sense of like what mom is yeah. versus me and like, oh, wait, like, that foot is part of are me? You? What, what is this? What is everything? And that's sort of what ketamine and other psychedelics yeah, take you yeah, to. Yeah. And what's happening, you know, the default mode network starts to come online and, you know, also the ego. So mm -hmm. we develop this ego as a way of keeping us separate. Because obviously, if we are being chased by a tiger and we're perceiving everything in this sensory based psychedelic space where things are just energies we're not going to run from the tiger so we want to have a healthy ego right mm -hmm. it's it's mm -hmm. carl jung said that we develop uh, we spend the first half of our life developing a healthy ego and then we should spend the last half of our life letting go of it mm -hmm. right and moving back to that self with a capital s mm -hmm. self um so the default mode network is basically the ego so it's the me network it basically, the name default mm -hmm. mode network, it's what the brain defaults to when you're not doing anything. Right. So it shuts off when you're in an activity or a task, but then when you sort of just go back to yourself in your own apartment and you're alone a lot, the default mode network will get very overactive. So in mm -hmm. people who are lonely mm -hmm. and people who ruminate a lot, and of course we see that paralysis by analysis in people with depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, it'll start to get really, really overactive. So there's a reason why we wanna nudge the brain away mm -hmm. from this very, very overactive default mode network. Mm -hmm. People with certain disorders have underactive default mode networks and we don't wanna use ketamine with them. So mm -hmm. namely schizophrenia, they don't, they don't have enough. But for most mental illnesses, it's actually too much default mode network. So you can kind of see, oh, and it also boosts brain-derived neur neurotrophic factor, BDNF. BDNF yeah. And that's sort of the miracle grow for the mm -hmm. brain. So if, for example, because of the root cause metabolic disorder that is spiking your blood sugar, you have a high A1C that's rapidly mm -hmm. shrinking your hippocampus, the primary so uh, site of adult neurogenesis, by revving BDNF, you can help mm. the hippocampus to make new brain cells and sort of undo some of that damage. Wow. So now you're seeing, oh, and when as it relates to trauma especially, what's really fascinating, this study, they did it in rats, in rodents, uh, mice or rats, I can't remember, but they basically scanned the rodents' brains before. They initiated some sort of like a neglect or trauma mm -hmm. by like, oftentimes in research, they'll like take nesting material away, which sort of is like uh, a child, okay. like with yeah. parents who don't love him or her mm -hmm. or pay him or her attention. And then they sort of scan the brain after. And what we saw is in the neurons, these dendrites, which are like, you know, like these things that should be like nice and up and buoyant and sort of like sticking out mm -hmm. that helps, you know, these electrical signals and these neurotransmitters that allows these uh, these happiness chemicals to flow mm -hmm. from neuron to neuron. After trauma, they go flat. The amazing thing is they gave these rodents one dose of ketamine and they scanned the brain again. Guess what? After one dose of ketamine, those dendrites were like the trauma never happened. Wow. So you're wow. actually repairing the brain, the part of the brain, the neuron that is damaged by sexual abuse, physical abuse, mm -hmm. trauma, war, all of these events, you're actually fixing the brain. And right? what I know of it, it's not just during that experience, it actually is long lasting. Yes, correct. It's not just like, oh, I can only have these brain health experiences during ketamine or during the psychedelic medicine experience, but it actually corrects and then like, you're kind of like reset. Yes, it's a reset. Yeah. You know, a lot of people say it's like a reset for mm -hmm. the brain. Or it's sort of like putting a cast on the mm -hmm. brain. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, as you just said, it's not just in the moment, it's mm -hmm. what you're doing mm -hmm. with your life. It opens this, what we call in research, this window of neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. which is why you don't just want to do ketamine and not change your life. Right. Because you have more BDNF for yeah. days, weeks, perhaps months. You have this dendrite You've got repair. to integrate. You've got to do something mm -hmm. differently. So if you are, you have this neural pathway 
that's etched in the brain because every time you feel stress, you smoke. If you have this BDNF, if you have your brain connecting in different ways and you can actually start to exercise every time or go for a walk every time you want a cigarette, it's gonna be that, mm -hmm. that track in the brain, it's gonna mm -hmm. be laid down more quickly and more effectively and more deeply in that window, which is why you wanna pair it with psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. If you just take ketamine without therapy, you're wasting half of the benefits. Mm -hmm. You're gonna get some of the benefits, you're gonna get the, the revving of those neurotransmitters, you're gonna get less inflammation, but then it kind of just like falls flat mm -hmm. because you're not actually accessing um, this, this window. And when it comes to trauma reprocessing, you know, something that I do with your incredible wife is <laughs> we use ketamine and the way I use ketamine is in, is in a very novel way. And usually for somebody with trauma, instead of giving them like one big dose of IM ketamine, like mm -hmm. 50 to 100 milligrams and just, you know, and that That'll sometimes get you helps. That'll there, yeah. Uh, but what I like to do is may will come in the room, uh, we'll do like a lower dose of some of ketamine, mm. especially for people with trauma or, you know, also for anxiety disorders. Yeah. Cause I think the, the way that IV ketamine clinics just sort of base the dose on weight. I don't think that's a good idea at all. Mm. I think we should look at the personality type and what they're experiencing. Mm. So when there's unprocessed trauma, what I like to do, May is going to inject, you know, closer to like 15, 20, 25 milligrams, that opens up this window where the trauma reprocessing is really, really deep in the brain. Mm -hmm. So then we are actually, and because it's a lower dose, you can actually process and talk. Mm -hmm. So then mm -hmm. I'm actually doing that therapy. It's like one foot here, window. one foot there, quote, yes. right? Yeah. So the eye mask is on yeah. and it kind of feels like in all these trauma reprocessing therapies, they take you back to the scene. Mm -hmm it almost feels like you're there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's tricking yeah. the brain yeah. into like taking the memory out, rewriting the memory and then putting it back. Mm. And you're doing it in a way that's 10 or I don't know, maybe a hundred times more effective than without ketamine. Mm -hmm. So then you can reprocess trauma, you know, in the traditional talk therapies, CBT based, it's 50 sessions. Some of these other modalities, you can do it in like eight, 10. Mm. Man, with ketamine plus the advanced trauma reprocessing, one, two sessions, yeah. and you're changing somebody's life and they feel better right away. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we'll, the second dose, we'll do either, if we wanna reprocess more, another low dose to give us like a longer window, or we can do sort of like 15, 20 milligrams of IM ketamine to start, and then 15 minutes later do like 30 to take them into the psychedelic mm -hmm. space. And then they're getting the best of both worlds, mm -hmm. what we call the psycholytic or low dose ketamine mm -hmm. states and the medium to high, quote, psychedelic mm -hmm. dosing, which is gonna give you more of that sense of connectivity, being a single point of consciousness, that love and connection is the true ultimate yeah, reality. Yeah. Um, the the a, through line of connectedness and all of life and everything yeah. and all of time and yes. all of space and time. Yeah. And the, those two things together, yeah. the trauma reprocessing and really fixing the amygdala mm -hmm. that's damaged and too overactive, plus this you know hyper connectivity in the brain turning off the default mode network, now you have this whole new way of being in the world. I'll say to your kind of last point of just a couple of treatments getting there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I won't say cured, I, I won't say um, fixed, I won't mm. say, well, I will say better. Mm. Um, as someone who has suffered for many years with undiagnosed PTSD, to finally get that diagnosis again, like I was saying earlier, just knowing gave me knowledge. Mm. It gave me empowerment and it gave me hope mm -hmm. and it gave me next steps. But as someone who has gone through a lot of personal work, a lot of therapy, mm -hmm. um, off and on, I had three, my first experience with ketamine assisted psychotherapy, mm -hmm. my first three were three sessions where I am yep. assisted psychotherapy. What was your dose? Do you remember? First one was the 2025. Yep. Uh, and then my booster, um, was my total, I think it was 50. So it went up to like, I think 75 ish. Um, and then my second and third were also the 25 to start. And then uh, my max I went up to was a uh, hundred. Mm. Um, and to share a little bit of my experience, like mm -hmm. I, I do believe my, every experience you're going to have is totally different and totally unique and is yours. I do credit what happened in that first session mm -hmm. completely like within the first couple seconds, complete and total ego death. I literally separated from my body, yeah. I, I, I died. My yeah. first experience under was, oh, I'm dying, this is death. Yeah. 
I do credit having that kind of experience and understanding of that experience to a lot of that therapy and a lot of that work, personal development, self-help work yeah. that got me to that point. Yes. But then the level to which that I was connected to everything you were just talking about, mm. but also immediately connected with my dead father mm. um, was really interesting because I kind of thought I was expecting I'm gonna re I'm gonna relive this trauma. Yeah. I'm here to get traumatic help work. I'm gonna have to relive this trauma in a new way that is going to help me process it in a better way. But it wasn't that at all. Ketamine therapy for me was just like everything I thought it was gonna be, but nothing like I thought it was gonna be. Totally. Totally. Um, what are your thoughts around like having such uh, an initial big experience as like an ego death? Is that common? Uh, or, you know, having done the work ahead of time, is that kind of like best practice? I think it is best practice. So the work that I do in my preparation session, I'm really setting up this framework of the ego versus the self, right? Mm. And if you have a framework, it makes that ego death, you know, ego death sounds sort of scary, but if you have the right framework, it's actually sort of beautiful, mm. right? So were you scared? Um, no, mm. I, I, I went in um, with the intention of full surrender. Yeah, And I think that really set me up for success because I, I read some things, studied some things, heard some things, and I've had some other psychedelic experiences before that. Yeah. So I kind of got a little taste or I had yep. an expectation. Yep. And so I was just like, you know, credit to my therapist and the work at the clinic I went to. Yep. Like whatever happens, just go with it. Mm. Or, or don't be afraid of it. Just ask, oh, interesting. Why is this happening? You know, yeah. okay, just, you know, just be present and surrender. And, and that served me tremendously. And if you can also trust that inner healing intelligence that mm -hmm. psychedelic researchers note, some part of you, some higher self knows what you need. So maybe it is gonna take you I back to the that, trauma yeah. or maybe you're going to see your father's spirit in mm -hmm. a different form and maybe that's what you needed, right? And, I did. And yeah, yeah. some part of you probably needed that, right? Mm -hmm. And talk I therapy could have never gotten you to there. So how did actually having that experience with your father's spirit, what did that do for you? For me, well, first of all, it got me to a point to where I can actually talk about it. Yeah. Like literally up until that first experience, I would not be able to talk about it mm. without reliving, mm. not just remembering, but reliving, yeah. feeling to my soul level, yeah. the pain and anguish. And like he was dying every time over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And I would become unsafe behind the wheel of a car, any little trigger, anything. I would have to leave movie theaters with a death scene. I, I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't mm. live my life in the way that I wanted to. Yeah. So yeah. first of all, it got me to that experience of, oh, I can think about it. Yeah. I can talk about it. I can, I can feel it. And it's not the same. Yeah. That yeah. gave me hope that, okay, I can work through this even more because mm. I never thought that I would get to this point. Beautiful. And what hope, right? And yeah. what a different yeah. way of approaching healing grief or moving through grief or embracing grief uh, that mm. SSRIs are not going to give you that. Standard talk therapy can't even really give you that. You know, maybe you can approximate it with some hypnosis, but you know, really that deep ego death experience and feeling, you know, it's a very common experience. When I'm working with people who've recently lost somebody, they will often say like, oh, mom's here. Oh, she was there. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, or my ancestors were there. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. you know, epigenetically yeah. inherited traumas. You know, this really incredible study looking at animals, uh, and you know, we think that it's just the things that you go through. But um, there was a study where they paired shocks with the smell of cherry blossoms, and it wasn't just those animals, but it was their children and grandchildren that also were there, were then afraid of cherry blossoms. So you no can way. almost inherit fears from your wow. ancestors because it's turning on, um, you know, these, these switches, epigenetics, it's turning on switches. So wow. if you have some sort of fear, maybe it's something your ancestors went through, which is sort of uh, woo woo and spiritual, yeah. but you know, there's some science behind that. Uh, it's it's really incredible. Can I ask you, so you've also done oral ketamine, right? Yeah, so uh, my first three experiences were IM, intramuscular, and then I've also done two different versions of at-home ketamine therapy, and that was uh, with a lozenge and then yeah. the trochee. Yeah. It's like same, same, but different kind of thing. How would you describe the subjective experience of IM versus oral? For me, and I feel like this, I feel this to be true for what we're talking about, mental health in general, but also I, I think you can take the same model and look at it as uh, like working out at home versus going to a gym with a yep. personal trainer. Yep. 
I personally feel gold standard is going somewhere with a professional yep. devoted to this work. Yeah. Gold standard. Yeah. You're going to get the most bang for your buck. You're also yep. going to have, I think, the most potential for healing. Yep. Or most potential for the next right questions, hopefully even some answers. Not to say doing this stuff at home can't yield results, because I did get great results at home, but I just feel like I'll say that. At home, the approach is a little bit different. You know, you got to like swish it around for like 10 minutes. And so it's not as quick and easy and sexy as like just an injection in the arm, yeah. which is fine. Um, I did enjoy the aspect of like, there is comfort at home. Yeah. There is comfort at home. But for some people, home could be a trigger, you know? So I, I think it's really interesting. But my personal yeah. experience was it was different. It was good. Um, I needed to go higher dose yeah. with um, the lozenges and oral to get kind of tapped into really also to dissociate. Right. Um, but I will say my, um, my last several sessions were at 400 and 500 milligrams oral, which yeah. is equivalent to what about like a hundred, probably like, uh, probably just like one above a hundred, probably like a okay. hundred, 25, which, but it, again, it's also apples to oranges, right? Yeah, Cause it's, you yeah. know, the IM is hitting your bloodstream like bam within mm -hmm. 60 seconds versus like, you got to swish that oral and it's, it's like, totally you know, ways, like, yeah. so it's like, just like this slower, more gentle rise. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you're absorbing it slowly. And then it's sort of leaving your body more slowly, mm -hmm. I think sometimes. Yeah. So, I mean, like it was same, same, but different. Yeah. I'll say this in terms yeah. of the journey, the experience, I did need a higher dose to get that dissociative state and to kind of really tap in. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, I see benefits in both approaches. Again, for me, gold standard is go to the facility where this is what they do, but also especially having the therapy before the integration. Um, so Detroit, 1955, I think you were saying. Yep. Yeah. So back in Detroit, the researcher's wife was like, oh, what if we call this a dissociative anesthetic, which is what it was designed for, for mm -hmm. anesthesia. So from 1960 on, really being used primarily by anesthesiologists and ER doctors. It's super safe. My husband uses it all the time. Like if a kid needs sedation for mm -hmm. something that could be painful without sedation, bam, a little bit of ketamine, fix whatever they need to fix and easy breezy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so interesting because it doesn't, uh, most anesthesia, you know, you're sort of on the brink of life or death, but mm -hmm. not with ketamine, right? It's not gonna yeah, be pressure. Yeah. Uh, you know, anything going on with your lungs or some of the things you need to stay alive, mm -hmm. uh, which is also why it was called the quote buddy drug um, back in the Vietnam, Vietnam War yeah, yeah, yeah. because it was given you know, to soldiers. Yeah. And you, field, if, yeah. if you and I were um, on the field together mm -hmm. and you got hurt and shot, I could just bam, give it mm -hmm. to you easy breezy, get you back to yeah. base. And Throw the doctor's going on me. Yep. Hit me up with some ketamine. You can yep. drive me back to safety. Yeah. So like a, 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 a buddy could give it to you. No problem. Um, it was being used in earlier decades, like in Argentina, there was this form of therapy, like regressing patients back to the womb. There was a super controversial, I thought this was really fascinating, uh, this psychiatrist who was using it for all types of severe mental illness, but he was using it in combination with all these other psychedelics and locking people in a room with high dose psychedelic medicines, including ketamine, and then projecting like violent scenes on one wall and sex on the other. And then, you know, then they kind of all like over the course of 24 hours. And I just thought to myself, that sounds effing terrible. <laughs> like that sounds like my own personal hell, <laughs> you know, being, wow. and, and then they do like family therapy and, you know, listen, that being said, it sounds like my personal hell, but, uh, <laughs> he also said that he had incredible success rates in treating these very mm. difficult to treat mental illnesses. Um, so going back to this mm. FDA approval. So, you know, it's, it's approved as anesthesia. There is one form of ketamine that people are now seeking, uh, Spravato. So mm. Spravato is spray, actually, right? yep, yeah. the nasal spray. It is actually FDA approved for treatment resistant depression. Mm -hmm. So the caveats are number one, yeah you have to be on another prescription antidepressant because Spravato is not that strong. First of all, it is only, there are two ketamine molecules. So the original form of ketamine that we use for ketamine assisted psychotherapy is R-ketamine and S-ketamine together. Mm. Spravato is only a very low dose of S-ketamine by itself. So you have to go to your doctor's office. You have to take it there. You have to be on another prescription antidepressant and you kind of have to be on it indefinitely, right? So you're like going every single week indefinitely. So it's another kind of prescription, big pharma, lifelong band-aid solution. And of course, since ketamine is what, 60, uh, 60 some years old, it's not patented. So of course, big pharma is like, oh, let's 
tinker with the molecule and let's, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very, very expensive mm -hmm. and they make a lot of money off that. Um, the reason ketamine assisted psychotherapy is so expensive is because you have multiple healthcare professionals wrapping around you um, and, the, you know, just the site and the malpractice uh, to use something There's work like this. that begins before you ever step foot in the clinic. Correct. I can tell you that. Absolutely. And, and, and after as well. So like our program is, um, when you break it down per hour, it's like, I think around $260 per hour. When you look mm -hmm. at like how many hours, like your wife and I are going to be yeah. one of yeah. us or both of us is going to be with you for hours mm -hmm. and hours and hours. Uh, usually like six ketamine assisted psychotherapy sessions to start plus standalone preparation sessions, mm -hmm. integration sessions. So it's almost like this intensive outpatient based treatment where you're getting like these rapid results uh, within like a two mm -hmm. to four week time frame. Um, but it's just remarkable what it does. And then, you know, so the difference after you finish that intensive period that can, you know, I think the biggest barrier for most people is just the cost to yeah, start. Yeah, I was going to bring up accessibility. I mean, in, in any kind of, especially I think mental health avenue, therapeutic yep. avenue, accessibility cost is always a big issue because sure. we think about people who maybe are suffering more, yep. they're most likely in a lower socioeconomic status. Yep. So it's like the people that need it most are the ones that really can't afford it. Correct. And wherever you go, whether you go to an IV ketamine clinic or ketamine assisted psychotherapy, the national average per session is going to be anywhere from like 500 to a thousand dollars per session. So mm -hmm. obviously very, very expensive, especially if you need six sessions to start. Right. And then, but the nice thing after you exit that crucial period of stacked doses, you know, maybe two a week for three weeks to mm -hmm. start with psychotherapy, the results will last up to four months. Without yeah. therapy, they're only yeah. lasting 30 days. So you can kind of see, yeah, it's expensive and time consuming to start, but then if you only need one session every mm -hmm. four months, so you're looking at three doses per year to keep the depression or anxiety, to keep your brain making all of these beautiful new neurons mm -hmm. and new connections, great. Easy, mm -hmm. right? And then you're really looking at an alternative to daily medication for mm -hmm. depression or anxiety or OCD or eating disorders and yeah. all of the things that it can treat, which is just remarkable. Uh, but I will say that barrier, I think the at-home ketamine mm -hmm. version that can cut the cost down from, you know, let's say five or $6,000 to get started to like a couple hundred bucks per month. Yeah, yeah. That's, a lot of that to me is like great. Monthly model, yeah. it, it's, you know, as you said, Yes, in clinic gold standard, but for some people, if you can't afford it, I think setting up that at-home model mm -hmm. with concurrent psychotherapy in person or online is is a great affordable option. Yeah. Well, well, Mike, this has been incredible. And I, I, I feel like from here, I could definitely go a lot more with you because I've experienced, I've been on the receiving end of yeah. this medicine. And my audience has heard me talk for a long time about you know, what I have been through, what my family has been through, which mm. really kind of takes us back in the beginning when I was talking about how humans can go through the same traumatic experience mm -hmm. and it imprints very, very, very differently. Yeah. Um, and, and I love, I, I want a big takeaway here for the listener to be like taking care of your body as much as possible, yeah. as well and as long as possible is always going to set you up for success. And I think here, the important takeaway is the, the resiliency we can have to trauma mm. by so many things uh, as sleep, mm. uh, as human connection, mm. uh, and making ourselves more resilient to yep. the inevitability. Yes. If we walk out of our door of something negatively affecting our lives and imprinting lower T, capital T trauma. Mm -hmm. um, but then if we're on the other side of it, there are a lot of modalities we can use yep. through mental health, through therapy work, to get us there and ketamine therapy, it has done that mm. for me. Mm. And after three sessions, I am psychotherapy sessions. I literally felt like what I would equate, but at that point, the last 16 years yeah. from when that traumatic event happened to yeah. me and my family, I felt like I got 16 years in three sessions. Wow. <sighs> Mind blown the level to which I could talk about and, and you know, even just think about mm. and, you know, still get upset sometimes, mm. but just like, I, it was totally different. Yeah. It wasn't the pain and the reliving yeah. getting upset. It was, oh, like I'm upset for Chase 16, 
10, 15 years ago yeah. that couldn't do this. Yeah. I'm, I'm upset for my, my choice or my, my um, indecision to like process this and just to feel it. It's a whole nother perspective. Yeah. And I, I literally feel like ketamine assisted psychotherapy gave me my life back. Mm. But more than that, incredible. I took it for the first time on my 35th birthday. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So also another aspect here beyond just like healing, um, because of this kind of like God's eye view of, of my life mm. and, and my world and the world, mm -hmm. I felt like I finally started living my life mm. because I knew who I was mm. for the first time in 35 years. Wow. So wow. healing from trauma, but also meaning and purpose. Yeah. It cracked me wide open in the best way possible. Mm. Talk to May, like ask like how different was Chase before Academy yeah. and after. Uh, it, it's it's transformed my life. It's transformed my marriage. It's transformed my relationships um, with my family. Yeah. And just now also another part of mental health healing that I love so much that I, I'm now in mm -hmm. is you get to feel better and you get to mm. work on your life and you get to take your life back. Mm. But then especially in someone like my case, mm -hmm. other people who have relived that trauma, mm -hmm. I now get to be a champion for them. Yeah, I am able to talk about things and be with them in ways that they are not. And like, I have helped my family heal in unique ways. Mm. And in doing so, they teach me new things as well. So it's this just back and forth healing process that I didn't even know existed. Yeah. But I never thought like I would ever get there. What was the one or two words of Chase before? And who have you discovered that you are? What are the one or two words that come oh to my mind? Gosh. Um, May would say uptight. <laughs> May would say like, she always called me like officer tuning or sergeant mm. tuning. You know, I was always by the rules. Yes, yeah. no, black, white. Yeah. You know, I, I always say this analogy. I'm the guy before academy, before psychedelics, before all this, I would stand on the corner and wait for the crosswalk sign to turn and say walk because that was the right thing to do. Mm. Even if there's literally no other cars. Mm. But it just introduced so many ways in my life of like, it's okay to question things. Mm. It's okay to keep things that served you in your life that you still resonate with in terms yep. of values and right and wrong and all that. Yep. But who's right and wrong is that? Right. And so it, it right. introduced this whole level of lovely gray area in my yeah. life that yeah. I have fully embraced and stepped into. And at 35, I started finally building my life. Yeah. And going, I resonate with that. I don't. I believe that. I don't. I've never questioned this before. Should I question it now? Yeah. And not a like, oh my God, what is the meaning of life? Like, let me question everything, but just a curiosity mm. and an innate knowing that has reminded me that has it has always been there, mm. but I just have suppressed it. And it was trained out of you, right? I love that word mm. curiosity. I think the two things I always see on patients' face in ketamine sessions are awe and wonder. And if we can just have awe and wonder mm -hmm. and curiosity and compassion for our experience and why do I want to follow that rule of, oh, of so walking uh, or, or not, or what do I want to do with my life and why that's life-changing. It seems so basic and fundamental, but like, again, there's a root cause of that. Yeah. Mike, um, this has been a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. And to bring it all home, my final question, um, a big, you know, kind of to highlight the, the work that I did, yeah. um, like I said, the death of my father, ever forward, these were his words. Mm. This was his mantra. This is the way that he lived his life. He said oh, the example know for us growing up. Yeah. And literally up until his last breath is something that he just embodied. Mm. Um, that everything is here, is happening. It's up to us to make meaning out of it. Mm. I, I like to go that route rather than everything happens for a reason. Mm. Everything happens and then we give it reason. Yeah. But here's your level of awareness to kind of like introduce that. Yeah. Um, so that's what Everford means to me, where it comes from and everything we talk about on the show, I hope is a way for the listener to kind of pull something and to apply to their life, to move forward in life. Beautiful. When you hear that, what is your interpretation? What does Everford mean to you? First of all, I didn't know that that, uh, your podcast name came from that. So I'm just truly touched. You know, I think Everford to me is, is realizing that no matter what age we are, we always have to go ever forward and we continue to grow. You know, as somebody who is in my forties, I, 
I'm still discovering who I am mm. and I'm still curious about life. And mm. age really is a mindset to me. And I feel oftentimes like I'm 12 years old yeah. <laughs> and I credit ketamine for giving me some of that, right? And, yeah. and all of these constructs yeah. and consciousness and the things that we see are really just illusions anyways, right? Mm. You know, when, when somebody's listening to this, it's, you know, digital coding and zeros mm. and ones that you're experiencing, but you know, it's not really happening in real time, but your brain is telling you that it is, right? Mm. So all of these illusions. So what if we just unpack all of that and we got to the root and we're always sort of, as you said, curious with awe and wonder and this discovery and curiosity. I wanna live like a child till I'm like six feet under and, you know, <laughs> and, and I really want to, um, look forward to mm. death as like the next great transition and passing into something mm. else, you know, and, and, and something not to fear, but to, to look forward to. I don't think, you know, mm. truth be told, I don't think I'm totally there yet because <laughs> I, I think I also really like my life, you know, it <laughs> well, feels I mean, of so a human rewarding. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think that with more work, I, I still want to do more work to uh, reach that. And I just always want to be ever forward with awe and curiosity and, and also purpose, you know, like I love taking care of the people um, that I treat. I, I, I was saying to uh, my husband and our other friend who's a physician and I'm like, oh, we all have kids, right? Like the people we take care of, I kind of feel like <laughs> I'm, I'm reparenting them. I feel like I've got children, even though I, um, I don't have any human children. Um, and if I can keep doing that and helping people, then I'm always ever forward with purpose and awe and wonder. Beautiful, man. I always say there's never a right or wrong answer. I appreciate every interpretation. Uh, and that's a way for me to just kind of bring it back home to the, the theme and the reason of the show here, really. Awesome. Uh, well, Mike, we're going to have all the information down in the show notes, the video notes for everybody, but where can they go to connect with you most online? Uh, drmikedow.com. I'm at drmikedow, D-R-M-I-K-E-D-O-W mm -hmm. on social media. And the Ketamine Breakthrough is the name of the book. Uh, you can go to the Ketamine breakthrough.com also. Which by the time you're listening to this and watching this, it's all live. Yep, with some free goodies there. Go to that all website right. too. Beautiful. Well, let me kill the interview there. Thank you so much, Mike. 